So for those of us who are already here, welcome. Um, so if it's your first time here, this is our studio visit program that we started earlier in the year to sort of support local artists in these slightly strange times. So of course tonight we have Samuel Swope, who's an artist based in Hong Kong here. Say hi to everyone. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining. And yeah. thank you Parasite for inviting me to, to do this. Um, yeah, we're glad to have you. Yeah, please. So, uh, yeah, as Jason mentioned, I've been based in Hong Kong ongoing now for about 12 years. And then um, in, I originally came here in 2006 because I had received the, a Freeman Asia Fellowship Award to study at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Then in early 2008, I moved here um, for the past, for those remaining years, uh, Hong Kong has been uh, the city where my home and my studio has mm -hmm. been based. And then it was from 2017 to 2000 or December of 2019. I was bouncing back and forth between Hong Kong and Chicago, Hong Kong and Chicago in between semesters because I was a visiting artist faculty member at, in the Art and Technology Studies Department at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And uh, uh, through, I would say throughout these years, over 10 years now, I've been developing my methodology and philosophy for uh, research and studio practice that I define as aerial art. And I merge multiple media and <clears throat> engineering practices. I construct and control aesthetic environments that work with air and off, are often themselves airborne. And I often engage issues on hybridity, uh, atmosphere, autonomy, agency, and the non-human. Uh, I define aerial art as the construction and control of aesthetic objects, environments, or systems that work with air and are often themselves airborne. Sculptural drones, uh, flying hybrids, uh, artificial winds, and microatmospheres, name just a few examples. And something very important for me is that aerial art frames air, giving it a perceptible and systematic volume. Uh, in my experience, uh, air, as we all understand, is, is, uh, is not only just a subject or an object of science, but air is through my research and through uh, my focus, I see it as also a medium for art, a medium that foregrounds flight and air in all sensory and dynamic qualities. Mm. An early example of my, uh, my practice from 2010 is titled Banana Mission, A Monkey Behavioral Study. Let's take a moment to watch this short film.
uh, Banana Mission, a monkey behavioral study, is an interspecies narrative about the intersection of technology and close non-human primates. Now, Banana Mission is not a thorough ethological study. It is instead a behavioral intervention that, through an anthropomorphic lens, explores first encounters. Uh, as you could see, Banana Mission was filmed in a variety of locations around Hong Kong, starting with the flying banana taking off from the produce section of a supermarket, and then to its first encounter with the feral rhesus macaques that live at Gumsang Gongyun, which is also known as Monkey Mountain. Uh, the Bana Banana Mission uh, video was produced in seven unique editions, which you can see at the bottom right corner of this slide. And it has uh, screened in a variety of locations internationally, including the International Symposium of Electronic Art in 2016, which was hosted in Hong Kong. Something very important to the short film is the Banana Copter. The Banana Copter is a sculptural drone. Uh, and it is a technological natural hybrid that is made of remote control parts. And very important here is ample amounts of banana residue. This banana oil is olfactory stimulus for the rhesus macaques. Now in 2020, uh, this year, earlier this year before COVID got really bad, uh, I joined a group show at Krupik Kirsting Gallery in Cologne, Germany. Uh, and the title of that exhibition was uh, called Hunter Killer. And I, of three works that I sent, I sent this new work titled Lithium. And Lithium is also a sculptural drone, but it's for a performative installation. Lithium is also a technological natural hybrid, but it mimics its form and behaviors from insects and commercial drones. Airborne, it understands itself spatially according to light by using biomimetics or phototaxis. The work itself begins with a US patent. Do you, wanna, do you wanna explain briefly what um, phototaxis is? Yeah, sure. So uh, when we see insects navigating and understanding them, their, their self mm -hmm. spatially according to light, that is phototaxis. So uh, when we think about moth to a flame, they're attracted to light. Fireflies that glow the light from their um, bottom, uh, they, <laughs> they also are attracted to the light. So it's about understanding oneself according to proximity of light and the intensity or luminosity of light. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the importance of this work actually starts from a U.S. patent. And this U.S. patent is from uh, a corporation, uh, Amazon. And as we all know, Amazon has started uh, their drone delivery programming program or they're pushing for that. And at the same time, they have created this patent for the drone delivery program, so they say, uh, to dock uh, drones on top of these street lights, maybe in between deliveries to recharge, um, to take a break, uh, to dock. And then, so the patent basically is another plan for smart street lights, which are growing in numbers uh, all across urban environments to collect a wide range of data. In the performative installation, the idea here is to pull down this light as uh, may maybe in an act of defiance. And then the light exists on the ground, slowly walking in the exhibition space, light facing upwards, calling for that drone, like as if it's a beacon. Lithium then once airborne uh, navigates towards this street light following its disposition to dock, but then it's unable to do so due to the orientation of the light. Thus it is left with the behavior a moth to a flame. Here's a newer version of this sculptural drone uh, made a few months back. 
in developing the work, uh, I made the conscious decision to keep the technology behind sensing the light, similar to how Valentino Breitenberg describes in his 1984 book, Vehicles, Experiments in Synthetics Psychology. Um, the sculptural drone we're looking at here is made of TPU, which is a flexi flexible plastic. So this particular sculptural drone is soft and squishy and is resilient to impact. But like uh, the first iteration of lithium, it also follows the behavior of a moth to a flame by understanding itself spatially according to light. And in the performance, the ideal uh, situation for me is a large space with numerous amounts of the sculptural drones made. And each one evolves in some way or another from one to the next. So they're all unique in some way. Mm -hmm. And then I keep uh, uh, the idea is in a way, each one would only have one opportunity to fly and one opportunity to dock on the street line. And then it would either land or crash or get caught in the net somehow. And then over time, through the course of the exhibition, they would begin to pile up. And they would accumulate in such a way that it would seem as though uh, we, something we see in urban environments all the time where insects have died uh, uh, next to lampposts or, or uh, our deck lights, et cetera, et cetera. Then after the performance, I would then collect a number of these and then uh, put them on a light panel and treat them as if they are taxidermy. This is very similar to the way that I exhibited the first iteration of lithium at, uh, in Cologne this year at Kupi Kirsten Gallery. Are they operated by you or are they automatic? So uh, they are automatic. They they. <clears throat> all the uh, knowledge for them to understand is built into the uh, sculptural drone itself. Mm -hmm. So there is no need for an auxiliary computer. Uh, they, they are what they, all the program is built inside. All the electronics necessary for this is built inside. And then what ends up happening is uh, you train them to that specific light source. So the street light, you train it as if it's machine learning, for example, uh, so that it understands the luminosity of that light and then it's able to navigate towards it and understand it. So, um, this one we're looking at here, I'm actually currently building this one as we speak, which is evolving also from the previous version where it's also incorporating some of those flexible components, but it's also maintaining a hard shell that is also iridescent so that when it is in a light source, we see rainbows of colors, which would be very similar to what we see on, say, uh, jewel beetles or the iridescent sheen on some moths. Um, uh, oh, okay. Yeah? I was just going to say, are the antennas on the drone actually functional, or is it just to sort of mimic the look of the moth? Uh, in the previous versions, it's mimicking. Uh, mm. But as they evolve, those antennas are actually Wi-Fi antennas. So, okay. yeah, they, it is like this. And uh, I think that is something very important to me because uh, in my art practice, I feel that technology is more than just a tool, but it's also something that um, conveys meaning and is a message. And so I tried to carefully choose how I use technology in my work. So I have prepared uh, a couple videos to show its behavior in uh, one of the iterative programs. We can get an idea of how it behaves with it.
So, uh, 2020 has been a very interesting year of using the home as a studio space. And as you can see, uh, it's not a really ideal place for test flights. But nonetheless, I, uh, the work is, uh, uh, is developed and it is ready for, I've been currently searching for the right venue to, to do this performance and, and I'm continuing to make more iterations and allowing this sculptural drone that behaves like a moth to a flame to evolve. So um, next I would like to talk a little bit about my experimental explorations that happen in, this, in my studio practice. Um, quite often I begin work from concept by experimenting with materials and technologies. And I'm gonna share three examples of of this where I'm working from uh, thinking about the aesthetics and dynamics of air and I'm also in these three I'm thinking a little bit more about demanding uh, a level of, or a feeling or a level of stillness in the observer. Um, in this particular one I was looking at simple imagery and descriptions of a wormhole, which is mm -hmm. a tube with two open ends uh, and the two connecting two points that are in different space-time relationships. And in this particular example, I'm thinking about dust being subjected to an atmosphere that has a balance between negative and positive pressure so that while it's in this microatmosphere, I'm able to illuminate the dust and to suspend it endlessly um, to the negative and positive pressures. So the positive pressure blows it up and the tube, but just the right amount so that it cannot escape the top point and falls down due to gravity and also that, that negative pressure slowly and then is continuously cycling, cycling, circulating over and over again. And I, again, in this one, thinking about the dynamics of negative and positive pressure, finding the perfect balance, as well as the aesthetics and dynamics of this uh, dust moving through air. Is that actually dust or is it kind of like dandelion seeds type? It is uh, the parachute from the dandelion seed, but mm -hmm. all the seeds are meticulously removed, meticulously removed, so that it appears as if it is simply just particulate dust. Um, but it's because that seed is a wind dispersal seed, it works phenomenally well for yeah. this experiment and for this, this work really. Um, that that's more you know thinking through the studio as a place to experiment but and then getting this work ready to the point where it's ready to exhibit or be fleshed out and produced um, for the right venue then this is another example of a um, experimental studio practice where and again i'm trying to think about demanding a certain stillness and i was thinking a lot about uh when we communicate, we're not only sharing knowledge, but actually we're sharing each other's breathing space. And we understand this is even more important now because COVID, uh, when we are communicating with one another, we are breathing with the family members, particular matters. And then I guess idea, I'm thinking of a very simple relationship as well with the HVAC system in controlled uh, environments that we use buildings and so I'm using those that same medium of the HVAC system um, that we have in our building space I think it very simply flow an object and pass this object back and forth back and forth endlessly um, and then another example of studio practice uh, in the newer one, I'm thinking a lot about uh, diffusing uh, smell or olfactory stimulus inside of uh, a gallery space. 
So the idea for me here is to have a lot of these air stones placed along the ground floor or exhibition points, which are then connected by these tubes. These tubes go up to the ceiling and generate these very slow uh, uh, clouds that would appear slowly on the floor. And then it requires so much stillness in the space that mm -hmm. uh, if you have multiples of these and you start to have audience members, you would, the movement around would start to create a certain kind of turbulence or vortices that could be seen in these clouds, but then at the same time, it would start to blend up the different olfactory smells. And again, this is about sharing that atmosphere and sharing that breathing space. And these so are- So what's the, what's the gas that's coming out? Well, it's actually a viscous liquid that uh -huh. is being heated up. And then each one uh, is, is heated. And then I use a parasaltic pump, which then sucks the, the vapors off of that heated oil. And then it is released and diffused out of the air stone. So I'm really thinking about this one in terms of multiples and spread all out over the floor in a way, thinking about air circulation again, how this if with any subtle movement, it would then stir up the atmosphere and you would get that sensation of the smell. And then they would start to blend together. And this would be in a way, uh, very similar to my first experience that I had in a wet market here in Hong Kong. Uh -huh. It's in enormous, incredible about amount of smells is the sensations that you receive is just one after another, one after another, they're all unique and individual. And I think this is really important experience for me. And somehow I'm thinking about that when I'm, when I'm producing these kind of experiments in the studio with the idea that they would then become uh, exhibited. Okay. Um, another, what are, what are the smells that are coming out? Uh, in that one that you're looking at is a pleasant smell, but it also is a little bit of a dangerous smell because I put nicotine inside of it too. Uh, okay. So this is also kind of a, uh, it's pleasant, but it's dangerous. So I'm honestly, I, I'm thinking about that, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm thinking about that. Let's just leave it as that. I'm thinking about the pleasant and the danger at the same time. So, and in that particular case, it's, it's, it's got nicotine and it's got some pleasant smell as well. Cool. So, uh, which brings me to another example of how I work is uh, in my studio practice. Sometimes I, I begin by image making first, like having an idea, having a concept, and then starting to produce images. And those image in the image that you're looking here are uh, is a glass engraving, uh, and then another one here, which are quite large engravings on glass. And what they're attempting to illustrate is a, a conceptual idea about crossover, crossover, and um, again forced flight through drone technology. And I'm thinking about crossing over Nike Air basketball shoes with this drone technology, as well as artificial intelligence that's applied to professional basketball. And so then the idea behind the work is to use uh, machine learning information about basketball players mm -hmm. on court movements, and then trace this data back into the flight paths of these sculptural uh, drone sneakers, so that in this way, they behave like this specific basketball player or a specific movement while in the airspace of a basketball court. And at the moment, uh, uh, the, this work is existing solely as a um, uh, image, but it, it has enough breathing space and it is open enough that I'm able to begin this work very, very soon. And I've started tinkering a little bit with some of the drone technology that would make it possible for me to be able to do this. The sculptural part, uh, uh, I've, I've done enough, I've had enough experience in the past that I'm confident in my ability to make this uh, realization. Yeah. The hardest part of this work will be embedding the machine learning information uh, 
um, that data and collecting it and then translating that into flight paths. Now, uh, in 2016, I created uh, a work that also started with image making. So I built and constructed this coffee mug that's embedded with drone technology, intelligent drone technology, so that it's able to fly above its saucer. Uh, and then in 2016, in that same year, Kronos Art Center in Shanghai invited me to uh, do this work at a much larger scale, uh, at an installation which was curated by Junga and was part of their fellowship program. And uh, let's go ahead and watch a clip of that. So for me, uh, Floating Room is a compositional aviary for uh, our domestic things. And the hyper-physical uh, home products within Floating Room are in flux due to intermittent uh, flurries of airborne motion. Each floating pro product in, in Floating Room is a semi-autonomous airborne whimsy and it navigates with onboard sensors so that they choose between maintaining their hover and place disposition or float on. The floating products in, uh, in, in Floating Room are a hybrid of featherweight plastic forms that is merged with drone tech. And they maintain their conventional function while also aerodynamically traversing the airspace in which they reside. Uh, so, for put simply, for example, a flying lamp can also emit light. To do this, I began by shopping. I went to a Shanghai Mega IKEA, and I built myself a DIY vacuum former, and then seamlessly merged these new plastic um, product shells with the necessary drone technology. Rigorous tests uh, were quintessential. Rigorous tests about payload and balance. Uh, and then I started uh, with motion capture technology to control uh, the floating products, but I absolutely quickly abandoned it because I, I realized that there would be little to no autonomy within the objects themselves. And that is very important to me because it's an issue that I often try to engage with. And now this motion capture technology is, is important technology and it's useful. But for me, again, technology is very important and I try to be careful about how I embed these particular technologies that I'm choosing because I believe that they are also a physical message that conveys meaning. Now seen here on screen is the aerial perspective that the drones have uh, within the floating room airspace. Uh, thinking through this, uh, there, for example, back in the 1930s, the futurists were painting new aerial perspectives of their times. And the way they were painting these aerial perspectives were in the context of what they were, what they were living through. Uh, warfare, futurism, and this, in the same way I'm thinking about the aerial perspective of floating room also uh, reflects or is the our times. So in the context of our times, it's, it's reflecting. Can you still hear me? I just got a bar that came up that said internet connection unstable. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think, yeah. So, as I was saying, okay, okay, so as I was saying, uh, this carpet reflects, in context, reflects our times of, 
augmented futures, smart homes, to name a few examples. And then as you can see in the montage video, there was a cage that's surrounding floating room. That cage is intentional uh, as part of the, the work, as I'm hoping that it will ask the viewer to dare what they seem safe from. And then uh, the drones themselves, they, uh, they use image recognition of that carpet. They have, uh, amongst a number of other sensors to help make this possible, but I also define parameters in their program that would enable them to make choices about altitude, flight time, which product, and when to clear cache memory, for example. And then with this system, there were possibilities for encounters with other uh, home products. So for example, a floating rubbish bin may encounter and trim a house plant, or it may clear memory while airborne, go sporadic and crash. Every hour uh, I would ask, I had a performer uh, enter the room and I called this performer the floating room keeper or the keeper. And the keeper's actions included cleaning up the mess that the, that the uh, sculptural products, uh, sculptural drone products made. So for example, they quite often uh, would blow books and papers and boxes around and then the keeper would then come in and tidy up the space. But more importantly, the keeper would also take care of these products. Care was very important um, metaphor to this work. And the performer would mend their wounds, refill their energy, and then place them back in line. And the keeper would then sit on the sofa and restart the program. Um, for me, on every occurrence, there was a dynamic amount of change. There was, an in, and this was really important to me to create this space that had an indeterminable amount of composition, airflow, accelerated motion, virtual volumes, and also space-time relationships. And uh, now, for me also, floating room is also a physical message. Uh, that's folding satire with contemporary discourses regarding drone and um, flight technologies, as well as novel approaches to product delivery and smart homes. And Jason, as we were talking a little bit about earlier before we started this, uh, for me, through my use of drone technology, uh, I'm trying to decontextualize popular knowledge about UAVs. And also understand that drones now, like so when I first started using drone technology, this wasn't the case, but drones now are so much effectively employed in the uh, public and private sector. Yeah. That now that we share this space with the technology, there is a significant amount of normalization to drones. Mm. And, and as in floating room as a specific example of decontextualizing this popular knowledge of UAVs, I'm thinking of a ludic narrative as well that by enabling our domestic products with the ability to fly, but also training them and to follow certain behaviors in a way is like domesticating our own products. So in a way they then become, and this is why I say about care is because then they become almost more of like pets, I suppose, or birds that we are keeping as pets within the home. And then the another ludic narrative about floating room uh, is a story about product delivery, but that these products are actually drones themselves that you purchase remotely and then they fly to your house and they come in and then with the right amount of care, they would continue their disposition of observing, uh, flying, and floating, and also maintaining their conventional function. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, research is also an important part of my studio practice. And 
some contemporary uh, readings that I'm, I often refer to a lot because I feel that they resonate with my interest or my over, uh, well, uh, they resonate with my interests are Air is Medium, published by uh, MIT Press and written by Eva Horn. I find that to be a very influential, I see you Eva, thank you for joining. I find that to be a very influential essay, uh, very thought provoking, and I, I find the, the ending to be very commanding in, 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 its, in its way of describing artists who work with air, like Tomas Serenseno, for example, um, not so much pointing at our climate uh, as, a, a, as an object of science or pointing at it as like a problem, as if it's a, an object of science, but rather tr in asking the observer to regain an aesthesis of air. And I find that to be really powerful and moving. And I also uh, like a text by Janine Randerson, a book also produced by MIT called Weather is Medium. And then recently that came out this year in 2020, and I'm currently reading this, uh, written by Thomas, Thomas uh, Stubblefield. It's called Drone Art, uh, Everywhere War as Medium. And this is a really interesting book to be published in 2020 because it feel, I feel that uh, the way he divides the use of drones in art to be uh, also captivating and resonating a lot with my interests. And the third category he talks about is the animal remainder of the drone. And uh, I, I think the way he describes drones being used in art to be uh, influential to, to myself and also uh, uh, it's really nice to see an art historian writing about this medium. Uh, being used uh, in this time. Now, referring to this image that you see on screen, this is Vision in Motion published in 1947. Um, to the right, we see Maholi Nag here levitating a chisel. Uh, and he is using compressed air to levitate this chisel. I find it striking. I'm in awe by its effect. But I'm also, however, kind of questioning it because I understand physics in a heuristic way while also uh, I, I understand its relationship to Bernoulli's principle, the form of the chisel. So most likely it is not there floating or hovering in space, but rather the photograph froze a moment in time. In this text, uh, Moholy Nag starts to talk about a new possibility for sculpture. And this stuck with me the moment I read it. In 1947, he's talking about sculpture could be both material volume and virtual volume, from static to kinetic, from mass to space-time relationships. And through this accelerated motion, we would start to witness a certain amount of dynamics. And it is precisely, I think, I believe it is precisely a multiplicity of states that creates the possibility to perceive multiple volumes and multiple dimensions. Another uh, writer, Jack Burnham, uh, published you know, a lot of writings and coined some of the terms like systems aesthetics. And he is known for writing an art and technology and seen here as a triquarterly supplement from 1967, where he has an interview with Hans Hock. And to the right, we can see Hans Hock blue sail, which is a very simple relationship of a cloth and a fan beneath it. And it's undulating and billowing and producing an indeterminable amount of composition and undulation due to the airflow. And in this, uh, interview that he had with Hans Hock, he asked Hans, uh, so what about your air proje projects? Uh, if you could design them ideally or for optimal performance, what would they be like? And Hock replies, I would want all machines to disappear and for the sails or balloons or whatever to become completely autonomous. 
And then he later goes on to say, uh, or Vernon later goes on to ask, so what about the problem of air-filled structures having to be pumped up every few days? And Hawk replies, they are not stable entities with lasting properties. They are rather systems. They are like pets or bonsai trees that demand care. And so I think for this studio visit, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up on, on this slide. Uh, I, and uh, open up for any questions, if anybody has any. Uh, we, and uh, again, thank you for those of you who have joined. Yeah, um, if you have any questions, feel free to just ask them in the chat box and Samuel will be happy to answer them. I think I got one already. <laughs> Something I have wanted to ask is like, do you start from, or maybe I have asked you that before, like, do you start from the concept and then think about what type of technology you can use to realize a work or do you start from sort of what type of technology is out there and then think about what you can do with it so uh i want to i'm going to answer the question is, is uh simply first is both uh mm -hmm. one one thing about technology when it's cutting edge and it comes out it's hard not to be seduced by that it's really yeah. hard not to and so the saying goes when cutting edge technology comes out either the artist uses it or the military uses it so uh when an artist uses it and i and, and this is also work in my studio classes when i'm teaching I often try to get students to think from concept first because there's a danger of working from cutting edge technology that you may end up just producing the cool factor of that technology, but forgetting that is important for contemporary art to be, to yeah. produce feeling and be embedded with some sort of concept and um, thinking beyond just the form and materials. And so for me, most of the time I'm thinking through idea or concept and then seeing what kind of technology is applicable to that, but not as a tool, but again, as how it's embedding certain message or certain meaning into to the idea and the concept. So it's, it's kind of one of those chicken egg things, but for me, mostly it's concept first, and then I'm trying to figure out and work through that. And I think that's important. I really do. I think that's a good question. And uh, uh, but most of the time, I'm trying to work yeah. the concept first. Yeah. But with the knowledge, I do understand, and I know, and I read a lot, and I do a lot of research about technology. So it kind of goes hand in mm -hmm. hand. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Yes, I've sent one. Oh, I didn't see. How do, uh, Jason, I can't see questions. Oh, uh, um, would you say that this is kinetic art? Um, what do you Her, did you, you ask the question, would I think of it as kinetic art? Yep. Okay, so in a broader picture, absolutely my work uh, incorporates a lot in, about machines and movement. And the work that I'm producing is no longer work that is static and grounded, or the sculptures or installations I'm producing is no longer static and grounded by a pedestal or a plinth. Uh, Jack Burnham, again, in, in the 60s, was writing a, a really nice book called Beyond Modern Sculpture. And, and early in the book, he starts to describe artists trying to leave the plinth, leave the pedestal, leave the weight of, uh, leave, uh, get rid of gravity, get rid of the weight. And I, I, I would say there, I overlap and I share a lot of interest with kinetic art, but as a term, I seldom use it to describe my practice, um, knowing the history behind how kinetic art started. 
And then also at the same time, I'm thinking a lot through the dynamics of what I'm producing. So uh, something that's really important to my practice that I concern the utmost is the behavioral dimensions of control processes. Through this, it produces unexpected results quite often. So to have an object affect another object or to have for me then starts to pre and change that other object's state or the way it's thinking or the way it's behaving as well i start to think of that as having a lot of dynamic qualities so short answer i overlap with a lot of the history of kinetics simply through the use of machines and uh machines incorporated into uh sculpture or a sculptural practice and movement as well but it's not something I want to put as the defining uh, title of my practice. Yeah. yeah, Because you have shown the Hans Hacke piece and there was an amazing show in Graz and in the Tangeli Museum in, in Basel a few years ago called mm -hmm. Moving Sculptures. And they have also shown the Hans Hacke piece. So it's, I think you are not, you are in that field. I'm there, I overlap. I definitely have interests. Absolutely. Um, may, I ask, may I ask a second question? Mm -hmm. um, have you ever been asked that the results of your research have to, what the results of your research have to do with art? Are there people thinking, wow, you're more in the engineering field and you, you do research about this um, different kinds of gravity and whatever? Or are there, yeah. Is there a kind of um, misunderstanding, let's say it like this? Okay, uh, I'm going to repeat the question back to make sure I understand the, the question. Uh, the first question Harold asked was, do I feel my research has anything to do with art? No, have, have you ever been asked from someone else Oh, of your research have to do with art. So for me, it's art. I have shown your work. Come on. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but uh, no, no, uh, no one's really ever asked me that. But I feel, I feel research for a lot of artists somehow gets folded into art making. But not all artists do a lot of research. But I mean, a lot of them do. It's not what I'm trying to say that artists don't do research, but. No one has really said, does your research, what does your research have anything to do with art? No, no, I've never really gotten that question. Um, I feel, I feel like when I do my research, I'm always doing it with the intention and the thought process as an artist and with art as a, a big priority to, and art making is a big priority, but there, I'm, I'm not really an engineer. I just have maybe a little bit interest in engineering or, or a heuristic understanding of physics and, and, and engineering. And so uh, that, that maybe that question has come up before. Like, are you sure that, you know, all your, your interest in engineering is, has anything to do with art? But then, as you have said, as the, you know, we wouldn't we for me at least we wouldn't have we wouldn't have kinetic art without an understanding of some at some level engineering without that i don't think we would have it because it's important i mean you can't you can't move a sculpture in those times tingly wouldn't have been able to do it without motors for example yeah. so yeah, yeah. so i have some other questions from yes. the chat, uh, Sundance asks, do you have different approaches to narrative videos like banana mission compared to installations like floating room? Do I have different narr narratives? Narratives? Do you have different approaches to, oh, to, narr to, to, to videos like banana mission compared to installations like floating room um so 
I, I feel my approach to when I produce these narratives, I'm always thinking about oscillating in between uh, the playful and the poetic. So as a theme, that's uh, always something I often work from. And so humor tends to come out in, uh, quite often because of this playful side. But then there's also a serious side for me when I'm producing these narratives that somehow come out in the poetics, as well as uh, balancing a little bit of yeah. the pol political in as well. So there is a lot of works from my, my, my practice that I didn't share today, for example, it's like Ta 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 Ta, uh, which is a different narrative, but it's more about a guerrilla air performance and it's an intervention and it's an interruption to routinize life in Hong Kong. Um, this, this work uh, takes on a different narrative approach, uh, technically as well, because I'm, I'm thinking about an intervention and what are the behavioral results produced and in the case of ta 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 i had organized around 26 people with cameras um, and located them all amongst the the ground level of the city as well as the rooftop and then once i perform this once i go through the uh the intervention i then collect all the video source and then i'm able to assemble that in and tell the narrative mm -hmm. whereas with floating room i have more of an a narrative in mind, floating room, ecotone, uh, lithium, the new performance this year from 2020 that I showed in the beginning of this presentation. All of these have a more decisive narrative um, that, that are, and then I'm then giving the ability, I'm giving the uh, behavioral um, necessities to these objects, which then through their behaviors create another kind of narrative on top. Um, yeah. Great. And then next, Addison asks, well, it's more of a two part question. So first part, they're wondering about your relationship to your drones. You talk about them as being pets and needing care, but do you see them as growing slash aging slash changing over time? Um. I would, I'm going to stretch and say that I, I feel the thing that's growing and changing over time is myself. <laughs> but, including myself, it's in between documentation and short film, which is kind of... There was a very odd glitch in Zoom for a second. That's why I paused. I could hear myself talking from moments ago. But anyway, Addison, to answer this question, I, I want to say that to this point, I don't really see themselves as changing and growing. The only thing that's causing this sort of evolution is my own, my, by myself. I'm, I'm doing that to them, whether it's through the program or through change of materials. There is often the case, though, where their behaviors start they, when I'm using more machine learning algorithms, like the newest ones that I've been doing this year in 2020, when those, when I'm using and I'm training them with certain data, I do notice an interesting that behavior that comes out of them, like they're learning and they're growing over time and they're changing. But the form of them themselves is not like, and it's not indicative of, of how the human species changes from childbirth and to death. However, sometimes when they do, in the case of floating room, when they crash and their wounds need mending, their surface or their skin is wounded, it's changing, it's over time. So in a way, yes, but mostly that's due to myself and what I'm doing to them. That kind of relates to the second part of the question, which is, I'm also wondering if they are changing what you see your role as their guardian is in guiding those changes. Well, uh, I kind of answered that one a little bit already. I pretty much mm -hmm. did. Uh, 
um, it falls into it. I, I want my relationship with them as creator of them to be as humble as possible. As humble as I possibly can. Um, and again, it goes to that idea about care. There's also a level of frustration when I'm working through this too. Sometimes they don't always behave the way you mm. <laughs> intend for them to because it is computer programming or it is materials and as well as you're asking uh, a form that's mimic mimicking something else uh, that we've perceived in life or we're trying to create a new behavior through them and this sometimes can cause a certain level of frustration but I, I enjoy that I find the challenge to be uh, an obstacle that I want to overcome despite whether or not uh, it, it's rewarding you know it's just something yeah. I want to overcome mm -hmm. yeah there's one more from Valentina She's asking, are you working on new works installations? And does the fact that international mobility is reduced is changing your way of conceiving your new pieces? Yeah. So as, <clears throat> yeah, the new works from this year, the biggest obstacle has been working out of the home mm -hmm. uh, where, because of the, the, the things that I'm trying to create in terms of, uh, Air, the airspace in, in a Hong Kong home is limited. It's small. It's hard to fly stuff here. Yeah. Uh, uh, as I showed in the beginning, uh, the example of lithium in the home flying over this street light, the performative installation, and it ends up hitting the blinds and getting caught. Uh, this is a, a technical challenge, but uh, this year has been... And when I exhibited in Germany earlier this year, it was lucky enough that it was right before uh, the COVID thing became really dramatic and a lot of borders closed. Like most people and most artists, I find this year to be very challenging, but I also see it as in a way I'm trying to be as positive and productive about it as I possibly can be. As well, I'm not teaching this year, so I have used this as an opportunity to um, have an unwelcome, undeserved, and unpaid sabbatical. But the new works that are coming out mostly that I've been working on this year are through my sculptural drone practice. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about machine learning and artificial intelligence getting embedded into those sculptural drones and how they interact with one another and also with spaces. Um, for example, the uh, basketball uh, crossover work that I have just recently started. So um, that is a pretty, I hope that sums up your question, Valentina. Yeah. I was just thinking for lithium, could you have tested it under a real street light? I could, but that would be in contradiction to uh, my intended narrative for this piece. And because I'm able to do test flights mm -hmm. uh, with the orientation of the light as I, I want it to be on the ground uh, so that the drone itself can no longer dock on the light is more important to me to work. It's important for me to work in a way that's m closer to the final result. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Hmm? Okay. Let's have lunch. Have lunch? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, next week? Good. Good.
already. Yeah. Well, I, can I ask the, uh, well, I, can I ask a question? Well, no, maybe I shouldn't. But anyway, I, I, I like this question about how to, how artists are adjusting this year when they have international experience. You know, one example is what we're doing right now. I mean, this is a, this studio visit, I think is a good example of how we adjust and, and how we can continue to be citizens of art and have a community. And I think, and I thank you uh, for joining and having this visit with me. Absolutely, I appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, and thank you, Samuel, for sharing. Um, so yeah. Uh, we have a next studio visit coming up this Wednesday with a Hong Kong painter called Vivian Ho. So feel free to join that as well. Um, other than that, yeah, thank you again for joining us. And thanks, Samuel, again for sharing. And hopefully we'll see everybody again soon. Thank you.